with this time I go for mine, I get to shine Now throw your hands up in the sky I go for mine, I get to shine Now throw your hands up in the sky Hey everybody, it's Jason. We're back. Another This Week in Startups bonus edition. I've got a great guest here. My friend Kimball Musk is here uh, from OneRide. Thanks for stopping in. Thanks you just happened to be in town yep. with the fam doing something. Uh, business, pleasure, a little bit of both. Uh, birthday weekend. Birthday weekend. Whose birthday? Yours? It's my birthday, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Ah, very nice, very nice. Uh, how old now? Uh, oh, I'm t 23 Over, going on 23. 55. You know. uh, and uh, so this whole um, Twitter search thing has become pretty big. And you guys are sort of in the middle of it. Tell everybody what is One Riot and why should they care? Sure. You know, I have Twitter search, right? That yeah, works pretty no, well totally for right. me. So why should I care about this? Sure. So uh, One Riot is basically real time search for the web. Um, if you did a search on Google, for example, it's kind of like searching a library. It's a phenomenal resource. But you're seeing a picture of the web from a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago. Results don't really change fundamentally. Real-time search is all about what is, what's going on today, what's going on right now on the web. So if you did a search for uh, the LA Philharmonic, which is, uh, there's a new uh, conductor coming in in about 10 days, amazing uh, new conductor. If you want to keep up to date what's going on with, with the LA Philharmonic, the Donald uh, coming in, what, what, what he's all about. Uh, one Rye will talk about the iPhone app that he just, uh, he just released some videos of some of his productions. And it's uh, a res sort of a reflection of the web as it is today. Real-time search is what's going on right now. So instead of LA Philharmonic coming up first, maybe a news article or a blog post or a new static web page would come up, and you guys would know to index that above LA Philharmonic how? Sure, so that's a great question. So we look at what people are sharing on the internet. And if you think about the old days where people would link to, uh, to, a, to a website from a blog or from, a, from another website, the new, the new way of thinking is that people are going to share that link on Twitter, they're going to dig that link, they're going to share it on Facebook and other, and other environments. What OneRiot does is we look at sources from across the real-time web, Twitter being a major part of it, where we see what people are sharing. And using uh, that, that information, we can re-rank content in real time. Right. So we can see that the top content right now for the LA Philharmonic is the iPhone app. Right. So here I, um, I have actually the Google search, if you pull up my screen, for LA Philharmonic on Google. Obviously, Google's going to nail the first result, uh, as they should. Um, and a couple of other sites, the Wikipedia page, all Hollywood Bowl, all good stuff. A couple of news stories here, something about the microsite celebrating Gustavo. Um, but then if I go on to One Riot, um, I have Music Center celebrates. Uh, Dumadel, which is, I guess, something that was shared, I guess, on Twitter. Yep. So I see four shares here. So if you open that up, yeah, you'll get a. Uh, sorry, to the four shares. Click oh, on the four, the, shares, uh, four yeah. shares. You'll see that we have two tweets, so we can ah. actually show you those two, two tweets, what people said about it. And the one riot shares is we have a panel of users that uh, share what's important to them as they surf the web with our one riot toolbars, ah. and that helps us uh, decide what's important out there. Ah, so the people you're actually watching user behavior. So here, just zooming in here, the, the four shares that you have, two are from a tweet, and the other two signals of quality are people using a OneRiot toolbar. So there's right. a bunch of people out there with a toolbar. It's kind of like a compete uh, panel. Right. And how many, how many people are in that panel? Is this like 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people? No, we've had about, about 3 million people have downloaded the toolbar over the many wow. years. Yeah, we have the top MySpace toolbar on uh, Firefox and on IE, and then we have a top Facebook toolbar for IE as well. And, and why did, what's their reason for downloading it? Uh, well, it's kind of the top functionality for people who want to stay in touch with on MySpace or Facebook through their browser. Ah. And as, it's an opt-in. It's a double opt-in if they'd like yeah. to also share their activity with us. And we actually get quite a few people involved. Interesting. And so the, I remember the original name of the company people might remember was Medium. Yeah. M E D dot I U M. Yep. Something. And the idea there was, and I remember downloading and saying, this is really interesting, but perhaps a little too complicated. It, uh, was, a, it was basically a browse version of the real time web where you could actually see the content come up in real time. And it was, it was an exciting concept, but very hard for people to uh, adapt their way, that way of browsing. And maybe so we'll, too soon. Too soon, maybe. I think it's, it's good, definitely going to happen at some point. But what we found was when we put a search box in there, the growth just went through the roof. Right. And people wanted that interface. They so explain to be able to what the original going. idea was, because I think it's interesting on a show like this, as sure. startups, to talk yeah. about where you started and then where you finished, because it's obviously you started in one place and now it's changed a lot. Uh, and that's what good entrepreneurs do. Uh, I mean, Microsoft started building basic compiler, right? Sure. And Sony built uh, their first, you know what the Sony's first product was? No, I didn't know. It was a rice cooker. 
Yeah. <laughs> it was, I mean, they basically started with a rice cooker, then they went into tape recorders. Yeah. So, and I mean, it, if they... It would not be what they are today. Yeah. I mean, Walkman would have been the, the rice man or something. Um, so you started, and this the concept was... I'm just trying to see if I can say it in plain English uh, without the buzzwords. Uh, you could see where your friends were surfing on the web yep. in real time. Right. Via a sidebar... Mm -hmm. in your browser and in the sidebar you'd get like sort of a map and see your friends in like little clusters and what websites they were on. Yep. And so I loaded this and I started using it and I said this is fascinating uh, and it gives you that sort of like wow this is we're, we're actually a solitary or what's, what's seemingly solitary surfing the web is actually not solitary. Right. There's a lot going on here and did users when you t take us through how you decided this wasn't going to be a big enough business or people weren't used sure. to it? Was, was, the, were the, was it just users would start using it and stop? Or that there were just the people who were using it were the sort of a small group of people didn't get mass adoption? How did you know? Because it was about yeah. a year or two you did that, right? A year and a half? Yeah, about, uh, about almost two years ago, we, we like see, over two years ago, we launched Medium. And the, uh, what, what was quite fascinating is we got an incredibly positive response from users and we got an enormous adoption of the product. But the problem was not that. The problem was once the, the actual interface. I think anyone, you know, in startups will get will get will appreciate this. The interface itself was a fundamental challenge. People didn't want to use a sidebar. Yeah, they just didn't want to use it. Yeah, and sidebars no are matter annoying. how yeah. no matter how good of an interesting product, you just couldn't get people to embrace that. And then there was another problem was Internet Explorer back in those days. Uh, if you if you opened up a sidebar and you closed that sidebar, it was actually really hard for people to find out how to reopen it. Wow. And so we really struggled with fundamental limitations of the browser itself. So it's actually like really tiny little things that actually... It's unbelievable how, and it just kills adoption. You know, there's, there's a great saying that every single page you put in front of a user drops your, your growth by 50%. You know, so if you, if you come into a home page of, uh, of uh, any product, say Twitter, and you've got to sign in, and you've got to fill a form or whatever, every single page drops your user base by 50%. Uh, well, try that with, they, you know, when you actually have a, a, a browser that can't even deal with that stuff. Right. We found our growth was always going to be stunted by uh, the fact that we were, we were reliant on those browsers. And so you're sitting there in a company with, I don't know, 20, 30 people working there, and you guys are based in Colorado. In Colorado. In Colorado. We have an office in, in the Bay Area as well. Yeah. So you're sitting there with your 20, 30 people, and how long before you sort of that early warning signal went off, like, this isn't working, at least not to the level we want it to, we need to make a change. And then before you had this sort of discussion with your staff, was the staff coming to you saying, I'm not sure this isn't working, or they sort of being good soldiers and not telling you what they really thought? You know, because I've seen this happen in my companies, like where we're doing, we have a mistake and maybe people don't speak up. Sure. And it's sort of this awkward moment, like, what we're doing is not working. Right. And nobody's saying it. And then once somebody says it, everybody's like, oh my God, yes, it's totally not working. I'm so glad you brought it up. H how did that go down? Yeah, I think, uh, um, I mean, one of, one of my strengths and one of my flaws, I'll be honest, uh, as, an, as an entrepreneur is, is I, I expect results very quickly. Right. And if I don't get them, I, I assume that I'm doing something wrong. Right. So for me, it was not a case of, uh, you know, let's, let's review this in three months. I mean, from day one when we launched, the, the, the uptick didn't match the usage. You know, so we were getting, you know, in, a, in one month we hit almost half a million downloads, and yet on a daily basis we were getting thousands of people to use our product. Right. That doesn't make sense. Right. Right. Something doesn't work there. Right. And so, so that was something that was broken. So we did spend uh, a good six months trying to solve the technical problem. Uh, it, was, it was very hard, frankly. Uh, and we did solve the technical problem of, of, of some of the challenges people were having. But at the end of the day, uh, we, it, from my perspective, whether it's a strength or a flaw, I, I, the alarm went off right. three days off the launch. Yeah. You know, and, and, that, and that made me start looking at alternatives. And when we, we actually put our prototype for the search product out three months after we launched Medium, you know, so it was that quickly we, were, we responded to, the, to, to yeah. the, 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 the lack of usage we were seeing. And then when the prototype was out in the search, it was amazing to see... What, it should have, what we should have seen, right? right. This sort of growth and this blossoming of yeah. utility. And, and it's interesting, you look at something like Twitter. Yeah. Explosive growth right now. Yeah. It's the biggest story in tech. And raised $100 million last week, a billion dollar valuation. I mean, incredible. Um, and their traffic went like this yeah. for two years and then like that in year three or something to that effect. And, and that first year was SMS only. 
Yeah. You can, it was no website. Exactly. When I started using it, they signed, they signed me up. Ev or Biz signed me up on their phone, and it was only uh, on my phone. You can only do it through SMS. And I didn't even know what a short code was at the right. time three years ago. Uh, so there's something too sticking to it. But you're impatient, so do you ever feel like maybe you're missing opportunities because... No, there's, there's truth to that. Yeah. Um, I think, though, I, if, I had, if I had been Twitter, I would have seen the problem. In the Twitter's case, I, they saw the problem that SMS was slowing down their growth, and they could fix the problem by applying it to a website. Uh, we, we, in a sense, did the same thing. We, we saw the problem was a technical limitation of these, of these browsers, and how do we get it out of the browser? And so just make it a, a traditional website. And so, uh, from our perspective, uh, you know, uh, from my perspective, I could argue we did something similar in terms of trying to find the right way people will use our technology. Right. The key point, though, is I mean, the technology we built was phenomenal. I mean, a, a real-time index for the web is, I mean, never been done before. You know? Right. And, Pretty hard to do. Uh, it's unbelievably hard to do. And scale. You know, anything's easy without scale. I mean, this is scaling to, you know, to uh, we have, I think, peaking at about 50 million share events a day. Wow. I mean, the real-time way people have no... And you know what's the most interesting is a year ago, maybe a million share events a day. Wow. And so now Twitter has just grown Twitter's so only, quickly. Twitter's only one component. There's, right. there's, there's Facebook. There's, I mean, but the growth is out of control. How do you deal with spam? Because on Twitter now, everybody's sort of hip to, oh, if you put your links up there, you're going to do great. I know when I click on the sidebar with the trending topics, like yep. when TechCrunch 50 trended last week or two, two weeks ago, you click on TC50, and then I would see all these people like, oh, my God, I made $300 in grocery coupons. Right. And, and then I saw another one. Oh, my God, I made $300 in grocery coupons. And I said, do we have a company here in the demo pit that's giving away coupons or something? And I click through, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is somebody yep, they who's watch built the robots. Topics, they watch yep. the trending topics, and they insert themselves. Brilliant. How do you get those people out, or is it you can't? Or do you no, I, I think OneRiot has probably some of the most advanced spam prevention uh, technology out there for Twitter. Uh, so right. Twitter is, is, is incredibly easy to spam. And what we do is we have uh, multiple layers. So one is, obviously, we only care about what links people are sharing. So first of all, we, we go crawl, we crawl that page. We, see, we, yeah. find, we dechrome it, fix it up, determine if it's spam, porn, things like that. But the next level down is, is actually what, what there's two there's two interesting things in uh, in Twitter which is there's a spoof spam which is actually quite popular spoof spam so you're pretending to be a real person and you're not no or no you you're, 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 you're uh, this is a great so basically oh I know spoofing you're pretending you're somebody else like spoof email no 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 it's actually it's actually intended for for humor so you know that uh, the Iran election everyone's talking about the Iran election and you tweet something that is uh, you know this is a, a picture of someone getting you know beaten down on the street and the picture is actually a picture of a naked guy. Yeah, you know, right, right, right. I you know, it's so. like and it's, that is okay. okay. That's the twelve-year-old exactly just like, having fun with yes, uh, with yes, users. Yes, 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 yes. And so that's you, the dig crowd or the right. what's the four chan crowd? Just they're just effing with people. They're effing with people and yeah. it's and it's funny to watch, but it totally messes up your search results. Absolutely. Right. And then the other one is the spam rings, where that they're trying to do is they're, they're, they get a group or probably a fake group of, of you know, 50 to 100 accounts right. that will have a conversation, uh, with, have each a other? conversation with each other about a link and try and elevate content uh, in, in sort of a real-time SEO, so to speak, right. uh, but it's total spam. And right. so a lot of that technology, we, we, we're kind of ahead. And one, one of the way we, ways we do it is we have an internal you know, real-time ranking of the most influential people on Twitter. Ah, so you can just say, like, we, we know that anybody below this amount of followers or this follower yeah. ratio. If this person is creating something that's really that, that hype, well, let's, let's double check it before yeah. making it. You know, so there's right, things right. like that. So did this URL actually wind up, did, did uh, Scoble or any of these top people actually do that URL exactly. as well? Because they're not going to get caught up in it. You know it's real. Exactly right. Ah, that's very interesting. So here I'm looking at, interesting, I just did the, the biggest spam term ever, Viagra. I think I spelled it right. And um, here, if you look on the screen, uh, the first you know, one is uh, an Ars Technica story and has 566 shares. I think that's an, that's an exceptional number of shares. Oh, I see. And the actually, shares include dig, so include tweets, dig. and well, oh, that's pretty brilliant. Yeah. So uh, it, are the shares equally weighted? Because, I mean, a dig can get 3,000 digs. Sure. Are they 10 to 1 to a tweet? Uh, we have actually uh, a, uh, an algorithm internally that actually decides on a content on a content topic by content topic basis, right. where how to weight dig, how do we how to weight tweets, and how to weight one riot. Got it. Interesting. Um, and oh, so a one riot person though, chances are they're going to be a little bit. 
They're they usually better because they actually b went to the page. Right. We, we can see how long they stayed on the page. We can see whether they scrolled. We can really, ah. you know, and these are trustworthy people because they've right. been with us for a while. Right. So we will always... Uh, do, do the people who are like under six months get weighted differently than the people who've been over a year? Like It's there... usually based on their surfing habits. Uh, we can usually tell pretty quickly if someone is a Gamer. spammer. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they're hanging out on one side too much maybe. Yeah, or... exactly right. Interesting. And uh, the the one riot users you actually know how many seconds they're on a page yep, absolutely so does the number of seconds on a page is that a valid measurement is it absolutely so what we do is we look at this at the length of the page right um, and video is one thing we do fascinating so for for real-time search on video you want to be able to tell people what what the hottest content is but there's but there's a lot of content that people will share and someone will go check out the video and leave after a few minutes after 10 seconds oh, this right. isn't so great so what we're able to do with video is we can see, oh, this video is three minutes long. Mm. The average duration people watch it was for two and a half minutes. That's a very highly rated video. Got it. You know, only 10 seconds, well, probably not so much. Only one second, it's probably broken. Right. Interesting. And so um, looking at this, this seems like something, you know, your business of searching the real-time web, I'm wondering if this is enough to get me to switch off of Google, right? This is the big thing we all face. Mahalo sure. included Wikia search before Jimmy Wells shut it down. Utter failure. Did it for a year. I don't know if you remember Wikia search was going to change remember. everything. But, I mean, he's not a real entrepreneur, so he just gave up. But guys like us, we actually try for more than a year. <laughs> yes. uh, we have an ongoing joke. We call Jimmy, I mean, Jimmy Wells. Jimmy fails on the show. So anytime anybody's <laughs> on, and, and having two search companies that have actually fought hard, I mean, right. both our companies have fought hard to try to carve a niche for ourselves, it's actually really interesting to see you guys uh, do something that actually provides like, real value. Um, it's always good when the host doesn't turn his phone yeah. off. That's always terrible. It's probably some like a fan calling, like, hey, I'm watching you on TV. Um, let me turn that off. <laughs> what a disaster. Okay. Uh, but it's now it's working. I mean, are a lot of people using it? Or? Sure. I mean, I think your, your question on how do, how do you go yeah. up against Google, I mean, we don't really compete with Google. Right. And, and the problem is, you know, it's still such a powerful brand that you say the word search and well, goes, well, well why yeah. wouldn't I just use Google? Right. And the truth is, it's different results, completely different experience. You, you, when you use one right, you really want to get the pulse of the web on, on any subject. Right. Uh, Google's not going to give you that. Mm. But so what we do is in order to, to grow and, and build our brand over time is we actually work through a part, our partners. So we have a one right uh, a partner network uh, that basically people can take our search results and, and build them into their existing experience. Um, right. Quite a few uh, search engines have built one right results into, into their results. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be talking to you about it. Yeah, no, actually, exactly. I think it would, it would work well in our results as well. And it's it's great because it adds a lot of value. It's a it's it doesn't really compete with the other search results. It's, uh, it's no, it's different. It's it's sort of like a it's all, it's somewhere between news and regular search because you do get the little news box, but the news box doesn't take into account a new page on a regular site. It yeah. just takes into account news. Exactly. So it's, it's news, and not only that, it's the it's usually if you go to Google News, it's basically the New York Times and AP, you know, Reuters, and it, you it's know, a small so collection. many. I mean, one of the best examples when Michael Jackson uh, passed away, One Riot was the first to break the TMZ article on Michael Jackson, and the reason is because the triggers at Google just don't they, they take a while, right? Right. And they're not watching, and they're Twitter. not watching TMZ that yeah. much. You know, they'll right. put something on New York Times way higher than they put something on sure, TMZ. Sure, and the sure. The truth is, what people were sharing was the TMZ article. So you let people decide what's, what the actual powerful content is, and that's real-time search. So let me ask, we've got a lot of people in the audience. Let me ask the people in the audience to go use One Riot right now. One Riot, that's pretty easy to spell. Uh, and uh, it's O-N-E, not the number one. And uh, go do a couple searches and go tweet which searches you're doing and put pound twist at the end and which ones work exceptionally well, maybe even which ones don't work so well. So we can sort of discuss where, where this sort of new search works and where it breaks down. Um, I just did a search here for this week in startups, and it's interesting. It, it's got the people who are tweeting about stuff, and this is all the new stuff that people have been uh, uh, talking about just over a couple of days. And how 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 do you think this will these results will differ from just doing search.twitter.com, and they can't search there? Sure. Like what's my what's my value proposition for coming here over that? Well, what we do is we we do have the tweets in our results as well. So the to the most recent tweets will be in our results. Right. But we blend that with the content that people are sharing. You know, if you if you make a blog post about about uh, this week in startups, that'll be the top results. So you're the you're the you start with the link as opposed to the tweet. Exactly. So that's really what it is. If Much you're looking for the tweets, 
Go to search.twitter.com is great. But if you want somebody to take out the tweets and just we'll put the tweets second to the links, that's what you're right. doing, consolidating it all. If you want to see the content of the web you should be checking out, right. that's what OneRide does. Right. Interesting. Uh, and so what is the status of the company? I saw recently you guys raised more money. I mean, this yep. company's raised a lot of money so far. Yeah, uh, I mean, building a real-time infrastructure is incredibly hard. I mean, that's what we learned at Medium yeah. was uh, when we made the switch, we didn't switch to a different business. We took the technology we had and said, how can we, and this is a lesson for any startup out there, you want to take the assets you've built right. and say, okay, something's not working. Well, how can we take 90% of these assets and apply it in a direction that will work? Right. And we built this incredible real-time index, inc unbelievably hard to scale. And uh, how did we apply it? Well, let's apply it to search, and, let's, and we tested it quickly before we made a large investment. We tested it very well. Right. And then we applied that technology to it. So it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, they so say lucky for you that real-time web actually was sort of happening as a trend while you were doing real-time sort of surfing the web together. Exactly. exactly. We, it, we, our vision was people want this. They, right. they want this experience. We didn't necessarily predict how big Twitter was going to get. And yes. Twitter, the difference between Twitter and Facebook is their open API, right? right? So you can't get this data off Facebook without, without using, you know. Scraping technology. All that sort of stuff. Yeah. And so if you, want, if you really want to get the link data off of Facebook today, do you pull any of it yet or you're working uh, on we it? We have methods of, of, of getting a broad audience of finding out what's hot on the web, uh, but nothing, we don't, we, don't, we don't go to any of the Facebook APIs, but there are other ways of finding out what people in general are interested in. Interesting. Well, is it those people who have public-facing profiles, you can scan the top users or something? Yeah, it is. See what links yeah, it's a lot of it's confidential in how we oh, do it. But basically, it. The, the idea is we don't want a, a purely Twitter bias. We want to be able to look at a broader audience. Ah. And so we have quite a few uh, confidential sources that we ah. use that are uh, that are very powerful in helping us tell us what's what's actually important. Ah. Other toolbar data, maybe even people. Other toolbar data yeah. is... Uh, there's a f quite a few examples that, that will probably come to light over the, over the next uh, That's great. six to 12 months. Yeah, it's interesting. You can um, uh, probably just launch a lot of instances on EC2 of like Windows machines and go scrape the data off of yeah. Facebook. But Facebook wants everybody to create for their platform. It's sort of, I mean, it's almost like Zuckerberg is getting the, the, the sort of metaphor of him as Bill Gates. He's actually starting to earn or channel a little right. too much because... He asks everybody to build for his platform, but is not willing to give his da the data out. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's sort of doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make any sense to me, yeah. and it's it's very sort of Machiavellian. I, I, and I, I mean, I think the reason why Twitter's growth is so phenomenal is because they had this open data system. Right. Um, they they are uh, they are not just one company. They are eleven thousand companies building right. on this incredible open data. Right. You know, and what Facebook is is doing is they're saying, well, you can do it on top of the social graph, but you can't do it on top of the data. And you're very limited if, if you do yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, the social graph is great, but even if you use the social graph, they have all these requirements. You got to put the Facebook logo here. You got to do right. this. I mean, it's like, really, guys? I mean, like, we're building these applications for your platform to play games inside of it. We're giving you our content. It's, it is pretty amazing. I think, I think long term, Twitter might be the bigger play. What do you think? Uh, you, you... I think I, I always bet against Wool Gardens. Right. And uh, Facebook is a walled garden. So it's not to say, I, I don't want to predict that Twitter is going to beat Facebook, but I don't see a world where, wall, where walled gardens stick around. It's interesting. Uh, maybe they've got the hedge garden for a little bit, and then they're going to... That's what I mean. I think if... if, if open up as if, they go. I believe they're going to open up as they go. Because, they have to. I mean, everyone knows that walled gardens eventually fail. So right. if they don't, then they're obviously reading the wrong books. Interesting. Interesting. And so... Uh, the company just raised a C round or something, yep. and so that was fifteen million dollars. That or was ten? seven. Seven. Okay. Yeah. And you raised originally fifteen. Originally fifteen, exactly. And so the company's been going for th now three years. Three years. Yeah. And what what's next for the company? Are you, is is next is, is just scale. I mean, basically, we're now growing uh, at leaps and bounds, and uh, we now need to take our our scaling our scaling of the real time web to the next level, not just from the perspective of number of searches a day, which is growing really nicely, but also the volume of data coming into the system. Our vision is a time when you'll be able to do a full search of the web in real time. Hmm. You know, right now, it's very focused on the social web because that's really where the, where the value add is and what people understand. They want to know what people are sharing on Twitter. They want to know what's hot on the LA Philharmonic and, and otherwise. But over time, as you imagine getting enough data yeah. in the system, you can do the whole web. And so how do, you, how do you get all this data? I mean, uh, Twitter has the API. Yep. So you can just plug into their API and suck it all down, and then you have to store it all? How long do you store it for? Sure. How do you process it? I mean, they, this has got to be a huge amount of data. How, what is the, just even the connection to Twitter, is that taking up, like, 
you know, multiple megabits just to connect to them? I mean, how do they pay for it? Are they using the GIMP thing or? Well, we have, uh, it's funny, we actually, uh, you know, from the, when we started this, this business, we, th we looked at it from the perspective of really trying to serve up the results as the challenge. And actually what we discovered is that, that half the challenge is getting the, the data in. Right. And, and, you know, there's, there's, a, there's this, this, this problem that you face is every single solution you have only lasts a few months because the growth is so phenomenal. Right. And so we have, a, you know, we have a team that is dedicated to, to working with APIs like the Twitter API. And, uh, I mean, we consider ourselves probably the best, we're best in, the, in the business in terms of getting the data out of the Twitter API. We're right. very happy with, 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 with what they... I, I think the current status of the Twitter API is actually very good. Right. given what we can get out of it. Um, and it's a, it's a phenomenal cha challenge, uh, bringing, bringing all that in, but not just bringing it in, but you got to you see what links are being shared, you've got to crawl the page, you've got to despam it, deporn it, and then you've got to serve it up all within you know, less than a minute. Wow. That's really hard. It's a pretty, yeah, pretty amazing process. How, how big is the, the server infrastructure for this? Is this thousands of servers, hundreds of servers to do this? No, so that's quite interesting. So this, there's the, the traditional search you think about in terms of uh, the size of the index, right? right. And you know, 50 billion pages, 40 billion pages, whatever. Yeah. In the real-time web, you actually have a different approach. You think about it in terms of time. Right. How far back do you want to go? Ah. And so basically, we, we, have a, we basically have a server farm per day. So how many days do you want to go back? Well, that's a server farm. Wow. So we only go back currently one day because our goal is to serve up the real-time results. Ah. And as our technology gets better, we'll be able to maybe be more efficient about that. But it is, it's a it's a So you can very really basically business. do one at a time, one day at a time. Yeah. And so that means there's this huge opportunity to see the trend for 10 days or yeah. for 100 days. The real-time web over 100 days, how would you approach that? Do you just take the top searches and store them, or is it just too much data for anybody to it, do? Well, you can get much more efficient about it, but you don't also have to keep it all in real time. You know, the real-time mm -hmm. part is what, we, what really we're focused on, and, and that challenge of giving you a picture of the web as it is. Mm -hmm. So that's why we look back at going back a day and think, you know, it's, a, it's actually okay. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, what we would do if we decided to go back two weeks or a month is probably create a different architecture that, that leveraged that better. Right. Because in real time, you, wanna get, you, you really need to deliver the right answer right now. And so you don't have to go back two days. Mm. It's not as important. Interesting. And so what's the deal with the partners? You have partners who will syndicate these results and you just hope to get a link back or some SEO juice, or is it a revenue share? Do you include ads in the thing? So, yeah, so, or open-ended um, for now? Or? Yeah, we, we have our partners that are leveraging our results, and it helps their, it basically brings a, a, a better user experience for their users. And then uh, there are things we'll be doing over the next, uh, actually we'll be, we'll be announcing something next week which will, which will help our partners uh, uh, monetize using the real-time web, but we'll talk about that. Um, oh really? Later day, yeah. Oh well, there's only like 180 people watching right now. I'm sure they wouldn't retweet it. What you know, you know, include some opportunity to do real time ads or something? Or we'll talk about it next. Ah. Time. <laughs> no announcement for you guys. Sorry. Um, wh who else is doing good stuff in search? Do you think? When you look across the space, does anybody impress you, or particularly right now, Cosmics or any of this you know stuff out there? Or do you think it's just you know, it's such green fields in real-time yeah. search that we're all working really hard to, to make a difference. Um, and none of us, I don't believe, are, are competing with the end user yet. The end user still doesn't even understand what real-time search is. And right. shows like this help people help get the word out. Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, I love these, this early stage. You know, this is like search back in 95, 96, 97. Yeah. I mean, it's every, everyone was sort of competing, but the truth is everyone was actually just trying to solve the problem. And to me, this is, this is the best time to be in the business. Now, this is your second, third company yeah. as an entrepreneur? You, I, More you than were, that, <laughs> So what was the first big company you did? Sure. So I, I've been involved in quite a few startups. But um, my first one was Zip2. I did it out of, out of school right. uh, with my brother, Elon. Yeah, sure. And uh, we sold that in 99. That was an incredible run. That was basically 95 to 99. So the, so the New York Times. Uh, no, we sold it to Compaq. Oh, Compaq. Compaq owned Alta Vista, and they right. wanted to merge... Uh, our company and, and, and AltaVista to create a Yahoo killer, you know, because we were basically mm. all about content and the right. portals and so forth, and, and they were the search engine. You guys were like a content management system or yeah, something? Yeah, we were basically the most advanced content management technology on the, in, in, in Web 1.0. Awesome. And so uh, it was a great, uh, great exit for us. And then um, I, would, you know, I was an angel investor to PayPal with my brother, you know, uh -huh. being involved there. I was a, a CEO, startup CEO for a company called Everdream, which is actually, my, my cousins founded it, which are... You know, it's a little family mafia yep. going on, but lots of fun. <laughs> and that, that, that had a great exit actually two years ago. Um, oh, wow. 
And now I sit on the board of Tesla Motors and on the board of uh, SpaceX and One Riot. I have a the restaurant, the kitchen. Which and is, that's uh, an interesting thing. You So after PayPal, I guess that was, uh, and after that whole sort of adventure, down market, you're living in Colorado. You left the valley. Yeah. You were living in the valley, went to Colorado. Well, no, it's actually quite funny. I, I feel myself pretty lucky. So I, I left the valley and I went to New York and I started ah. cooking. And you started cooking in New York. I studied. I, I studied then I, and I started. So you and, make all this money and then you decide... Screw it, I'm going to go learn how to cook. Exactly. And, and where'd you go? The Culinary uh, Institute? Uh, French Culinary Institute. French yeah. Culinary Institute. And graduated from there and decided I was going to do a restaurant. Started the restaurant and sort of I moved out in 2002 to work on a restaurant in Boulder, Colorado. Got the restaurant going. It's turned out to be one of the uh, very, very successful This is the kitchen, ventures. which the is kitchen in like Boulder, Colorado. People talk about you have to like, it doesn't take reservations. And you have to wait online for a long time and it's like always sold out, but it's very egalitarian. Like... It's a, we call it a community restaurant, and right. it's a new concept. It's sort of high-end, but it's very casual. Uh, we work with local farmers. We're considered one of the greenest restaurants in the country. We've sort of pioneered a lot of the uh, you know, wind power in restaurants, and uh, we don't have any garbage. Everything goes back to, look, everything goes back to the farmers in the form of compost. Wow. Uh, the, uh, all of our tables are made from the wooden rafters in the building. I mean, like, we just wanted to create a, an example. Right, and what it became is a restaurant that you know really. It, I mean, the weeks we will do four thousand people a week in that restaurant. I mean, it's just incredible. Four thousand well, seats, and it's not a big restaurant. No, that's what I've heard. It's like a really hot ticket yeah. in Colorado. And so it's this thing which Boulder. became much yeah. bigger than I ever expected. And what was so fun about it, in retrospect, was I got back in the software business in two thousand six, and I got back in. And I come back and see my friends. Hey guys, I'm back in here. What should I? What, yeah. what, how's it going? And they all have this look on their face, like they've just gone through the nuclear wasteland. Right. Of 2000 to 2005, which right? Was brutal. Yeah, brutal time to be Tell a startup. Yeah. So I didn't really experience right. that. Yeah, you know. So it's quite interesting. Now I'm getting to get a feel for what it was like to run a software startup in, you know, possibly the worst recession in almost 100 years. So, yeah. which is an interesting challenge. You know. Yeah, I mean, how do you deal with it with your team? I mean, people must be panicking to a certain extent, like looking at their friends losing jobs, unemployment 9.7 yeah. percent, unemployment in the valley 15 percent. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. Really talented programmers, developers are out of work. Yeah, I'm assuming in Colorado it's worse than the valley, or is it similar? Um, it's similar, I think. Similar. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, I think it's probably similar. I mean, similar. the thing about I'm, I feel like I'm very fortunate in that uh, none of my startups have 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 not been able to to get the support you right. know, from the new investors or existing investors. So in other words, they're all they're all going. Which is great. In yeah. fact, some of them are just gangbusters. I mean, Tesla's right. are off like a rocket ship. Sure, um, but that came close. That came close. I mean, talk about a, challenge, a challenging company to build. I mean, right. building a hard company in any environment is a hard job. Right. Doing it in this environment it is extraordinary. Oh, that's out of control. Yeah. Well, I remember I sent my check in for Model S. Right. And so I, they gave the pricing. Now, I'm a big fan, obviously, and Alon's on the board of yeah. Mahalo and an investor, so we're pals. But um, I love the, the Roadster so much. Like, I can't even, I, I drive another car. I'm just like, what happened to the gas pedal? Like, right. it doesn't respond. I drive the Corvette now. I'm just like, this car sucks. You know, <laughs> like, it's not going anywhere. Do you have the Sport or the regular? I have the regular. I have, I have, regular. I have signature number 16 there. Yeah. I'm sure you have Founder Series. Yeah. You have Founder Series. Yeah, Founder Series, exactly. Yeah, so um, anyway, Inside Baseball, I write that, I see that at Model S is coming out. So I'm like, I got to support Tesla. I send two full deposits. So I'm like, I got to. Yeah, yeah. Support my guy and support you guys and the and the whole thing, and I got my numbers. And, then, and when I sent the checks, the week later or two weeks later was the Valley Wag story. That was like, oh my God, they have eight weeks of cash left. And I said to my wife Jade, I was like, well, um, I guess that was a good investment. <laughs> and uh, but I was I, I had a pretty good feeling it was going to pull through, and I got my reservation numbers for the Model S. Now I'm not founder series. You have founder series. Um, but, do you know what numbers I got? Number one and number 85. You mean, amazing. That's amazing. I have signature series number one. That's amazing. Which I don't know what to do with now because now it's like, it's the same thing with having a low model Tesla now at the 16. I, what am I supposed to do if I crash that thing up? I'm destroying one of like... It's an, it's you, you have something that's going to go into the museum at some point. Exactly. I know. And it's, I'm really, like, it's cool. So now that I've got, got 4,000, how many miles do you have on your Roadster? Uh, I drive mine a lot, so mm -hmm. I'm at... Uh, Maybe five broke, or six thousand. I, I mean, just broke. I just broke four. Yeah. And I'm thinking, God, I, mean, I think when I get to ten, I'm going to put this thing on blocks or something. But that's too much fun to drive. Yeah. So how could you do that? You got to drive it. You got to drive. Just it. drive it. Yeah. And the other thing with the car is, there's no engine or something like that. So moving parts. It's mm -hmm. made of carbon fiber. The, this car could last a hundred years. Yeah. 
I mean, you gotta change the battery, yep. but everything else is Everything else is, I mean, it's, it is, it's a very, I mean, cars, electric cars are much simpler than, yeah. than, than take, gasoline You just cars. take that whole little, whatever it is, out. Um, so, um, how do you keep people motivated? I mean, people must be distracted. They, I mean, it was really distracting, I guess, September to March. I yeah. have my own ideas about it, but how do you try to keep people focused on building a product and not panicking and not worrying about their jobs? Did you have to do layoffs at all, or we uh, size no, your staff a little bit? we didn't. We didn't, actually. Um, the... You know, I think we my, the lesson I've learned is you know just keep your company as lean as possible. Right. So you were you know, lean to begin with. We were lean to begin with. Um, uh, we actually had staffed up during the medium days, right. and when we decided to change our strategy, we did make a change in, in employment count. Right. Uh, because you, you know you want to make those as soon as possible for both the company's sake and and the employee's sake. Right. Um, and so we went, by the time the the recession you know collapsed or the economy collapsed. Um, we were actually quite a lean company, so right. we've actually been growing, which has been, uh, which actually good time to be adding staff. Great time to be adding staff. Amazing the high quality people who Incredible. are available today yeah. and reasonable about what their expectations are mm -hmm. as well. I mean, yeah. it's not like you have four offers coming in and you're chasing people who are. You know what's weird is we always find good people are always you always have to compete to get good people in your true, team. True. And you know even today you know the people we're hiring are incredibly great. I mean we're super excited about the new guys we have, we have coming on, and they they all have competing offers. And, These are know, people in the valley or Boulder? Uh, both. Both, yeah. yeah. So what, what, what's the breakdown of the size of the company between Boulder and, uh, and the, the valley? The Bay Area office uh, is the one that's growing. We still, we still add occasionally in Boulder, but the one that's really growing in the Bay Area. So it'll be uh, six people in the Bay Area and 25 in Boulder. Mm. I have a magic number of 30. If you go over 30, I find you know, that life yeah. is hell. Right. Yeah, As a C. I'm just. I agree. Maybe I look that. good at it or whatever it is, but I just love small companies, and so 31 for me is still crossing the line. But I can, I can, I can, I can function. I totally understand what you're saying because I think what it is is the number of personal relationships you can have yeah. with people. It breaks after 30. Yeah. It, when you get to 40, 50 people, you can't know what's going on with their lives. Yeah. You can't. You only have enough time for small talk, having lunch with people, meetings. And right around 40 or 50 or 60, you start seeing people in your company who you don't really know. Yeah. And as a CEO, you might not even know their names because they were hired when you were on a trip and you come in and like, who are you? Exactly. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, no, I make a point of, I have these one-on-one -on -one meetings with almost all my staff. You know, uh, mm -hmm. So anyone who has a direct report, usually, even if they're a low-level manager, I'll have a, you know, coffee with them once a month. Yeah. And you can do that with 30 people. Right. right? You have 15 to 20 coffees a month. Right. Right. That's fine. Right. 50 coffees, I mean, not so much. Not so much, exactly. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm traveling and stuff, so it really becomes really hard. And it's also, I just think the culture when you're that size is awesome. Everyone's yeah. gunning for the same goal. They, yeah. They're no not dead thinking weight. about politics, no dead weight. I mean, it's No great. ERs, no clicks. Yeah. Yeah, so interesting. And how did you raise the money during this really bad time? You raised it, I guess, two or three months ago, which means you must have started two or three months before that. Sure. Yeah, so it was a great, it's a great question. Uh, so one of the things we did was we spoke to our inside investors. And we said, look, this is not a great time to go raise money. We all we had a good discussion around that. What should we do? And they said, well, why don't you reach out to some folks you know, confirm that, and then we'll talk about it. And right. what I did was I called the folks I knew in the business, and I, I had the good fortune of knowing a lot of these folks. Right. And um, check the, the temperature. The, the first sign, first sign I knew that something was wrong, was all these VCs had plenty of time to meet. Hmm. Yeah, come by. Everyone had time. Right. And that that may sound like a good thing, but actually, I'm I'm pretty experienced uh, entrepreneur and raise a lot of money. Right. VCs don't have time when they're when they when they're investing. They are right. very very busy. And what I what I found was like, these guys have too much time on their hands. It means that they're not investing. Right. And so that was kind of the general feeling I got. And uh, we got we got we got a lot of excitement around what we're doing, but I didn't see I didn't see anyone you know there really was no, hungry. And there was no urgency in right, any of these, no urgency, any of these conversations. Right. And so. Um, and to close the deal, that's, you really do need to have a sense of urgency and a marketplace and yeah, a little totally. bit of competitiveness. And the thing is, VCs will, are happy to meet if they've got no, you know, nothing else to do, and it's kind of like the learning annex for them. They get to learn sure. what's going on. And I'm like, you know, I'm not the learning annex. You know, right. you know, we're either here to raise money or we're going to move on. Right. So I, you know, that was really fortunate for me because you know, we spent you know, a couple of weeks doing that. Right. And well, at least you didn't spend a couple of months. Well, it's probably a month because yeah. you know, it takes time yeah, to, yeah. to get these things together. And um, how many you meet with like ten people, five people? No, probably. I mean, I, I just 20. know a lot of these folks. Yeah. You know, so I'd say fifty to twenty people. So you, you know? do the you do the entire tour of Santel. You're doing three yeah. or four meetings a day. And these are all these are all quick ones. Right. And uh, generally so, half an hour to an hour. Yeah, meeting. exactly right. They book an hour. You're out of there in forty five. Exactly. Sometimes it goes an hour fifteen. Sometimes thirty minutes. Yeah. And you can gauge very quickly whether or not this is. I mean, I think 
how do you know if people are interested? I have my own techniques, but how interested they are. You know, I think what I've always found, you know, everyone talks about these, everyone likes to play games and negotiations yeah. and blah, blah. People who are interested are interested. Right. Like they are excited and they are engaged. So and enthusiasm. Question, enthusiasm that, that really is, you know, they, they are, they, something clicks in their brain. You right. know, you can see that. You connect with them. Exactly. They, they get the aha moment that you had exactly when right. you started the company. or And that's you, what you want your investors to do. The religion. They get the yeah. sort of religion. They've seen it. Yeah. And, the, and what happens with, I think, a but lot of... But you said also questions. Yeah, that so they're digging in. So people who are in, not know? interested, they ask one question that's just like, you know, what's your business model or what's your plan on China? Yeah. Or you have an international strategy, like some generic question. And they're like, okay, good. Yeah. And they're not even paying attention during the question answer, yeah. being answered. Exactly. And I think what happens, I think, in this environment, when I warn any entrepreneur, is this is the, the worst environment, I think, to raise money, not, not because of uh, the economy necessarily. I mean, obviously the economy is the driver, but investors right now, uh, they, a lot of them are actually excited to invest if they really had the freedom to invest. But right. not all of them, the LPs, the limited partners, are not that excited about you know, capital calls. Right. It's not a, it's not a the, the money's just not moving through the system. And, of course, they need to look after their existing portfolio. Right. So, so they're the, circling the wagons in yeah. some cases. And so what happens I found was there was a ton of maybes. Right. And there's you know, in my world there's there's three kinds of answers. Right. The best answer is yes. Right. The next best answer is no. And right. absolute worst answer is maybe. Right. It's a and disaster when it's a disaster. Maybe. And 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 I think maybe I, really means I am indecisive and you wouldn't want me as an investor anyway. Exactly right. And I got about eight maybes and I was like, Okay, that's bad. That's and, really and it doesn't happen with me. I mean I, these guys know me, right? So they right. They, they, they don't do that. But I just don't know if they had I don't it's they, probably uh, because they're they're in a little bit of shell shock right now. Yeah, totally they don't know if they can go on their L, go to their LPs and do a capital call. For people who don't know what a capital call is, venture capitalists don't actually have the money. They basically get a commitment for the money from what are called LPs. LPs are limited partners. They represent things like Calpers or Yale or Harvard's endowment. They basically invest money for a living. They have these huge endowments, and they give a little sliver, maybe one percent, to venture capital. So when the venture capitalists do an investment, they actually say, oh, remember you promised $100 million to my fund? We need six of it right now for Medium, or we need five for Mahalo, or we need 50 for Twitter, as the case may be. Um, right. But those LPs are suffering as well because they got wiped out in the stock market, although they're probably feeling a little better now. Yeah, but they're feeling much better now. And, I mean, the good thing about us is we had a strong syndicate, I mean, incredible investors, uh, Spark Capital out of Boston, Commonwealth out of Boston, and Appian out of Denver, that basically I had the conversation with them and said, you know, we... Uh, you know, I can I can really take this out on the road, or we can come up with a, with something that could work uh, with the so investors. So a reasonable with the valuation. Reasonable valuation. You're not trying to let's pump it up and double the last valuation. Exactly. Uh, let's 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 create a, a, a financial structure that sets this company up for success. Right. And it and sounds to me like sideways, like a B plus round sure, or something. Sure. Exactly. Which is what a lot of people are doing right yeah, now. Yeah, and I think it's completely acceptable to go to your your right. existing investors. I mean, Tesla went through this a few times where. You know, you, you, we had to make a decision of do we go out for an external fundraising or do we look internally, and we did that quite a few times. Yeah. You just got to make the right choice at the right time. Right. And right now, with the market the way it is, investors, if you go sideways in valuation, so you raised your money at $20 million or $50 million, or whatever it is, not you guys, just a person, an entrepreneur watching, to go to them and say, listen, we could get a little more runway here, we'll get where we need to go, put $5 million more in at the same valuation, they, it becomes less of a you know, negotiation, easier for them to go to their limited partners and partners in their group with and, and just sell it internally. Easier. Well, I think, I think it, the, what's, what, I always love to, what I always love about inside investors is, is they know the story. Right. They know how good it is or they know how bad it is. Right. Right. And so the great thing about that is when you, when, when, when you can be honest with your, with your investors and say, look, this is how good it is, right. and in one of case, this is how good it is, was, right. the, was, the, was the question. Let's figure out the, the the right timing on when we would do an outside round. Right. And um, the great thing about it is like, I didn't have to make the sale on the business. I just right. it was really just a negotiation of what of what the financial terms were going to be look like. Right. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, so uh, Sam X Ten says, if the re has the recession had any impact on your business? Sounds like fundraising it did, but you're pre revenue essentially, so there's no big. Impact um, on it, I guess. Cost uh, it, of doing actually, business is cheaper. There's, there's, good, there's, good, there's good stuff about this recession. Um, I, so I had a, a startup in the 90s, which was, was actually really hard because money was free back then. Right. And you had 50 competitors driving the price down to zero on anything you were trying to sell. Right. Now you're in a place where you've got a high-quality product that's differentiated in the market. People need it. 
Right. Your competitors are really limited. You know, they're, ah. they're not, they're not, they're, there are there are competitors in real time search, but they're but all of us are looking at building a business through this period, not mm. giving it away for free and you know all that sort of stuff. Ah. So the API calls without maybe your logo on them. Somebody like New York Times might actually pay for, right? Uh, so that could be actually a real business. Exactly. Uh, so is that is that occurring now, or is that something just we'd be considering? Uh, we'll like, be able to talk about things next week. Oh, right. Okay, I <laughs> forgot. Uh, but that would be a pretty good business model. Is if uh, I, I, I keep the logo on, I get it for free, or split revenue, or a more custom deal where sure. I yes. Well, this is I'm not speaking out of. But, but I think the point is yeah. the recession helps and hurts you. It hurts you yeah. if, if you need to raise funds right. or your customers are out of money. Yeah. But it helps you in that you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about the competition. What do much. you think the state of the economy is right now? And did you, I mean, I sort of saw this mess coming but never thought this bad. Yeah. And I didn't see a recovery coming and certainly nothing like this. What do you, you think is going on right now? Um, I think things are much better. Right. Uh, it, uh, it was, it was, it, it's, uh, the problem with that statement is much better doesn't mean good. Right. Right. Things are much better though. I think the most uh, visible. So I'll, I have a restaurant, right? So I have I have truly know wh what people are spending on a night by night basis. Ah. So is, is there a quite trailing lead indicator in there? Uh, it's, a, it's a great lead indicator. Alcohol consumption. No. Uh, wine? You, well, it, what's it, uh, what, dessert? What is? <laughs> Got to be one of these variables. <laughs> um, Tell me. Uh, wine is a good example. Uh, and it's not whether or not people are drinking wine. It's what, the, what are they spending per bottle. Ah. If you think about a bottle of wine, you can have a bottle of wine for 30 bucks. You can have a bottle of wine for $3,000. Right. right. How do you feel that night? What do you want to spend is really reflected in how much money you want to spend on a bottle of wine. It's a Rorschach test. You're still going to have an appetizer. You're still going to have a, a, an entree. You might or may not have dessert, but your wine is completely up to you how much you want to spend. Right. And uh, we've very recently, just probably the month of September, seen... A pickup that isn't as where where we were before, but a significant pickup from where we were. So six people ago are ordering around. the two or three hundred dollar bottles when maybe they mm, took a break. I wouldn't from say that. they're up there anymore, but right. they're they're instead of only, instead of ordering the thirty dollar bottle, which is well, our restaurant doesn't even really sell that many thirty dollar bottles, right. but they would find the thirty dollar bottle on the menu. Right. That was that was sort of March time frame. That was terrifying. Right. And then you go up to now where people are in the seventy to hundred dollar bottle and right. they're comfortable with it. You know that's. Yeah. That's a good sign that, that people right. are starting to appreciate good wine, appreciate what, what they're getting, that's and able to spend. Fascinating, and that's just happened when the summer or this September. Really? So it's just like, September. Just September, and that must relate to them watching their four hundred one ks or their stocks so, come huge, back a little bit. Huge. I, I think it's so much has got to do. I mean, most of these folks can afford the bottle of wine. It's it's like psychologically, they're they're kind of shutting down their their hmm. desires, so to speak. You know, this is this is this is a culture where we do appreciate. The, the finest things in life, whether it's you know a, a T-shirt or a bottle of wine or a trip to Europe or whatever, right. you know, e everyone has their version of what luxury is. People appreciate it here, and I think the past year has been a case where everyone just tightened down and aren't buying anything, hmm. and that that's just not sustainable. It's going to come back to some degree, not yes. probably to the craziness that was before that, but to something in between. And it doesn't need to be that crazy. No, to be honest, that was a little bit. It's weird. not healthy. Yeah, it's not it healthy. It was also weird. It was like who are these people taking? Homeowner loans or buying two homes it yeah. was like no. So I go to Burning Man every year, and Burning yeah. Man last year was the sign of the apocalypse. I mean, there were people were uh, companies were spending not companies but people uh, who right. uh, were wealthy individuals were financing half a million dollar skyscrapers in the desert that would be built and then torn down in a week. Wow, that's a lot of money to be to spend on. I mean, I love Burning Man and I I right. love them for it. It was a great experience. But you didn't You're have to spend half a million dollars on no. that. I mean, half, like, like, please, like, it's up and down and down. No one even knows it existed a week right. later. I mean, it is art, but still, it, it's to an extreme that made no sense because right. the art in the years before didn't have that sort of right. Uh, I mean, irrational... if somebody spends ten thousand dollars building some incredible art piece, exactly. or twenty thousand dollars, you're like, well, they got their friends together. Maybe exactly. other people buy, you know, big vacations to Hawaii. Maybe this is their way to do it. Exactly, and and I think that's was the years before, and then last year just got out of hand, and that was. What two weeks before the the, the big, Lemon Brothers collapse, yeah. and you could sort of look at it and go, "Wow, this is—is is it just me, or is this or things gone out of hand?" You know, right. and they clearly had gotten out of hand. Interesting. Uh, so, uh, if people want to work with the company, they want to use the API. Who do they contact? Where do they go? Yeah, well, just help them send an email to me. It's Kimball, K-I-M-B-A-L, oh, at OneRiot.com. 
Right. And you're hiring right now, so what are you looking for? You're looking for developers, PHP, uh, we're looking database? Only, only looking for search engineers. So guys from Google ah, and Yahoo. search engineers. Um, uh, we're looking for the top relevant search engineers in the world. Really? Yeah. And so the value proposition for them coming to OneRiot versus Bing, which is spending money like it's you know has my, no my, value, or yeah. Google, which has an incredible cafeteria. How do you get people to join your company? Is it the stock options? Uh, Is it impact? So I think yeah. I mean, first of all, being a Google, that's just a job. I mean, if you if you want a job, go go work for those guys. If you want to be part of something really exciting, come join us. Right. Um, so that's one thing. Then the stock options, obviously, there's an upside with us. There's probably a modest upside with the other players, but there's a major upside with us. Right. And then finally, the real, the really exciting thing is we're we're, we're on the, the cutting edge of search, and if you really are a top search engineer out there, you should be at the cutting edge of search, or you're not a top search engineer. That yeah, by definition. So there you have it. If you're a top search engineer, Kimball at OneRiot.com. Thanks for being on the program. And I'll thank the sponsors. Um, this is a bonus episode, so I don't actually charge the sponsors because we're just doing so many uh, episodes. But thanks to WebSpy uh, and uh, DNA Mail, DNA Mail, everybody loves DNA Mail, uh, Audible, uh, where everybody does their homework, and you go to Audible Podcast, right? Podcast, singular? Yeah, singular. Singular. AudiblePodcast.com slash twist, and they give you some incredible deal. And uh, Ustream which does a great job, and they did the TechCrunch 50. They did an amazing job there. And uh, anything else? Are there announcements? What's Friday? Do we have, who's on the guest show Friday? Uh, Joe, Bacon. Joe from, oh, Joe from Local Bacon's going to be on Friday? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So Joe from Local Bacon is one of my, is one of my favorite TechCrunch 50 companies. This company is awesome. Their idea is when you go to apply for a job, you ever put a, a you put postings on Craigslist sometimes. Sure. And have you ever actually received what you get in? And it's insane. It's insane. You get yeah. like 500 resumes, yeah, exactly. half of which are from recruiters or yeah. people from India or want to sell you outsourcing services. And how long does it take to just find the people in there? It's like one out of yeah. 100 is actually what you're looking for. So what Local Baking does is you put your job up there for free because you're a qualified company because you have venture back capital backing. So they vet anybody who wants to post. Got to be a real company. Then when you apply, if you're that search engineer, you say, I'm going to apply to this job. To apply for a job, you have to use a credit. Credits are a dollar each, and you buy you know, 20 credits for $10, gotcha. whatever. So when you apply for a job, it costs you a dollar. It's a credit. you know, It's like yeah. virtual currency. But let's call it a dollar. What do you get for that dollar? Well, you get to be, instead of in 400 with a lot of noise, you get to be one of 40 right. or 30. Then when they review your resume, you know that they've looked at it, and they give a uh, disposition to it. So they say, uh, you know, either pass or um, not qualified because of the year's experience, or we liked your resume, we're keeping it on file, thank you. So basically, you, you, they created a workflow so you, as a person applying for the job, get at least know where you stand. Right. And for somebody who's an employer, that's no big deal. If you're only getting yeah. 40, and then you have all the workflow there. It's an incredible company. I'm going to try to invest in it. But they did a great job at the TechCrunch 50 conference. So they're going to be on Friday. Yep, they're going to be on Friday. Uh, Any other announcements? Five passes, platinum passes, to the way to, five? The, uh, five to the Santa Barbara Music and Tech Festival. So oh, well, that's good. kind of a big deal. Yeah, they're good for both days, all the parties. They're like How much does that ticket cost? Like $1,000? A lot. I'll check. Yeah. So anyway, um, we're going to be doing this week in startups. We do them on location now. So this week in startups will be at the Santa Barbara Music Festival. I'm going to be interviewing the CEO of Last FM. You've probably used Last yeah. FM. Very cool. cool. Um, looking forward to that. And we'll be going up there doing it live. So if you want to come with us, as part of any time I do a speaking gig now, I say I'll do the speaking gig. But you got to give me at least five or ten tickets to give to the Jason Nation, the fans of the show. So if five of you, right now, thank the sponsors, you know who they are, at DNA Mail, at WebSpy, at Audible underscore dot com, and at Ustream. If you thank the sponsors on Twitter and just put um, Music Festival in there, we'll pick five people and give them the tickets. So you go to the Santa Barbara Music Festival with me, you can roll with my posse, you can roll deep into the tech conference, and it's for the whole thing, right, Alex? Yeah, it's all the parties. All, all the parties, everything. So this is like, these are worth like thousands of dollars probably. Uh, so come with us. If you Santa Barbara's like what an hour north of here or something, it's a nice. It'll be a nice day. We'll have a good time. We'll hang out. Uh, so thanks again, Kimball. It's awesome pleasure. to see you. Making me jealous. I want to go to that. Uh, the music. Yeah, that's right. This is but this is a great way to use your leverage. Like <laughs> I'm always like trying to get like, oh, you want me to speak at your event? 
okay, what can I extort out of you? You know, like, because uh, I don't need to be there. I'm busy. I got a kid coming, and so we try. It's my way of trying to lower the number of speaking gigs that we raise the requirement. Gotcha. It's not working. <laughs> That's the problem. So, like, I told Tyler, like. I'm only going to do speaking gigs when they give $10,000 donation to the school in Brooklyn last year. And this one, I'm not getting paid, but a lot of them would get paid. And I said, just, I don't really want to do this one in this country. It's like too long. It's, you know, and I uh, just tell them like $10,000 and two first class tickets. And, da, da, da. and uh, they comes back and goes, you're not going to believe it. They say yes. I'm like, oh. yeah. okay, so I got to go to that country. <laughs> so it, it's actually this sort of like yeah, perceived value. It, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyway, it works out really good because now when I go to events, I see all the fans of the show. And That's they're great. all 20-year-old entrepreneurs, 25-year entrepreneurs. It was amazing. And actually, they came out live last week. for A couple of you guys came out last week for the show. So we'll see everybody next, uh, this Friday, right? Two shows in this week. Uh, yep. And two shows last week. Yep. Does that mean we're doing two shows next week? I got a job. We got to get back down to one show a week. All right, we'll see everybody next time on This Week in Startups.